he would have warned all of us not to look at China through our liberal democratic lens. He would have warned all of us not to presume that China interpreted uh, our language in the way that perhaps we expect them to interpret it. They would uh, always have the speeches before the dinner was served. And the speeches would be in Chinese. Uh, and the translation of those speeches would be on the table of every other diplomat except the Indian, Indian diplomat, you know, the uh, Indian the, where, where my father was perhaps seated. So my father would have to actually go and pick up someone else's, <laughs> you know, translated version of the speech. And then, since he didn't speak Chinese, he would have to find someone who to tell him when, in fact, the speaker, whether it was Chu Lai or Mao Zedong, uh, more often Chu Lai and you know people in uh, uh, in the executive arm of the government, when they actually reached the point at which they were now criticizing India, because it's only at that point that he could get up and walk out to register his protest. The India and Pakistan uh, were at war in 1965. The Chinese Foreign Office summoned my father to the Foreign Office, I think around one o'clock in the morning. They issued an ultimatum to him. If I recollect, it basically said that India must withdraw some yaks and some sheep from the border or else the Chinese will open up a second front. My father's interpretation of that uh, conversation or that ultimatum was that the China, that China was issuing this ultimatum more to signal diplomatic support for Pakistan than to in fact carry out uh, a military operation on our border. And his advice to the government in Delhi uh, was that they must ignore this ultimatum. Oh, I'm not sure what, how he put it. I, I can't recollect the words he would have used. I'm sure he would have put it more, in more refined, refined language. But in effect, he was saying, this is an a ultimatum that we should not take seriously. And that's what the government did. The government ignored the ultimatum. And the Chinese did nothing. Mao Zedong was a man or the leader who, in effect, this was a revolutionary. He wanted to destabilize the established international system. He wanted to overturn uh, the international order that had been created immediately after. Second World War. He funded revolutionary movements. He funded the movements that were uh, following the principles of Che Guevara in, uh, in uh, Latin America. He funded the anti colonial movements in Africa. Uh, he supported the Naxalites in India. This was one of the most uh, interesting, in some senses, remembrances that I have of the Mao era, as, as I say, through the uh, seen through the eyes of my father, and as, as I remember, uh, when we think about what's happening today, when we look at what President Xi is doing, um, what I'm trying to say is not that President Xi is cut from the personality mold of Mao. What I'm trying to say is that President Xi's approach to the international order seems to be e equally disruptive. It seems to be looking to change the status quo in the same way that Mao sought to change the status quo in the 50s and 60s until he died, in effect, in the 70s. Um, and so what, Mao, what President Xi is 
doing with Taiwan, what it's done in the context of the South China Seas, the new security law that it has uh, uh, implemented in Hong Kong, uh, the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is, you know, another form of looking to create a China presence in those countries that are financially weak and face an infrastructural problem. And now, of course, the issue on our border. He would have warned all of us not to look at China through our liberal democratic lens. He would have warned all of us not to presume that China interpreted our language in the way that perhaps we expect them to interpret it. They have their own interpretation of their position in the world, and they have a very different outlook uh, with regard to the time that they need to take in order to achieve their objective. So there is a, both a difference in the way they look upon themselves, but there's also a difference in the way that they that they seek to achieve their objective, the timing that they, they have in mind to achieve their objective. China has actually unilaterally altered the status quo on our border. This is a transgression of our sovereignty. This is a fundamental shift in the nature of our relationship. We can no longer trust the nature of the relationship that has been built up between us and them. But the response that the government has now taken to China is very clear. It seems to me that they are determined on one hand, to restore the status quo and anti on the border, and on the other hand, to reevaluate the economic and strategic relationship with China. And in, in doing so, I think the government of India will be looking at, re, uh, at, at redeveloping or redefining the nature of the relationship that they have with China, sorry, with, with America with uh, Japan, with Korea, with Australia, and maybe with uh, the Middle Eastern country. The biggest chink that I would see uh, in the Chinese leadership's armor today is a chink that was evident in the 60s, and that is economic. The economy has slowed down sharply uh, in China today, and I would be very surprised if President Xi's position as a general secretary and as chairman of, you know, of various committees is uh, solid, as, as solid as it was, say, if, when the Chinese economy was galloping ahead at 8, 9, 10 percent per annum. Um, I think there are huge pockets of resistance to sheep. I think there are, they have, there are many, many uh, elements of dissidence within the Communist Party. And it would not surprise me if a lot of what's happening in China, uh, sorry, a lot of what China is doing vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world is reflective of the tensions within the Chinese economy and within the Chinese polity itself. <laughs>